Nestled in the shadow of the Heldeberg Escarpment in Altamont, New York, Indian Ladder Farms is an upstate New York family-owned century farm. Home to over 300 acres of apple orchard, hop fields, berry, and pumpkin patches, the farm also operates a farm-to-table oriented restaurant and a brewery and cidery focused on featuring estate grown and locally sourced ingredients. For this podcast, we talked about hops and what goes into being a hop farmer. Well, here we are at Indian Ladder Farms for episode number one of this podcast that we have no idea what the name of it is. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. No, we haven't. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure people are already live tweeting suggestions to us. Uh, we've got Dieter, we've got Alex, we've got Scott, and we've got our uh, producer Ian in here. Uh, I'm Jeff from EQX, and today we're going to talk hops. We are. It's it, hop talk. It's hop talk. So for now, episode number one of this podcast will be called... Tentatively hop talk. Hop talk. We're going to go over the history of hop farming at Indian Ladder Farms. We're actually in the, uh, in the cidery of Indian Ladder Farms now, beautiful facility here. Uh, deep history at Indian Ladder Farms with the hops. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about what I think is probably going to be the funnest moment of this podcast. That's infestation. And the, uh, and the yeah. challenges associated yeah. with hops. Yeah, we, we aren't all as thrilled as you are, Jeff. About yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like having a yeast infection. Yeah. With you. <laughs> Literally, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll talk our favorite hops. That's going to be a fun segment. Yes. And uh, we'll get very specific with the Heldeberg hops. So let us start off with, I guess, Dieter, uh, we'll start off with you and... Tell us what the motivation was to, to start growing hops here at Indian Ladder Farms, and how far back did this process begin? Uh, well, I guess that's the reason we're all in this room, is because I decided to grow hops. Um, so up until about, uh, what was it, uh, 2009, there really weren't many hops grown in New York State anymore, and they were trying to bring the industry back. So I went to a seminar at the Saranac Brewery, Hops 101. And I came back to the farm and I said to my wife, I said, we're going to grow hops on the farm. And she said, you absolutely are not. (sighs) (laughs) Because as she always says, you don't need another project. And she's really wrong. But after a couple of years, I couldn't resist. And I did put in um, some hops and just to try it out, see if we could grow it. Uh, We put in 100 uh, they, for better or worse, did very well that first year. We picked them. We had our first hop picking party, and uh, we were on our way. Uh, so the next year, we decided, well, let's expand that and put in a thousand. And uh, they did well. We got everybody together. We had a hot, another hop picking party. Um, it was about that time that the farm brewery law in New York State uh, came about, and. For those of you who don't know what the farm brewery law is, it's, uh, it allows you to have a manufacturing license and a tasting room um, in New York State to make craft beer and cider. Really a game changer. It was a total game changer because at about that time, once we had the thousand hops in and we, we decided we were going to expand out, we became, at first we were thinking it might be a commodity. Um, to add, and we weren't going to really build a brewery or do any of those things. Um, And we found out that growing hops is very difficult. Um, It's a a high-value crop. So in the farming world, high-value means high input. So you have to think of crops that are very high input, like um, apples and grapes and roses and sweet potatoes. They, they will, uh, you can get a very good price if you're able to grow them correctly, but it means you're going to really work at it. You're going to put in a lot of resources um, in order to, to get to that point. You started off with 100, then, uh, ten, uh, then 1,000 after that. It would seem to me that that's not very cost effective because... Uh, a thousand, although to us lay people might seem like a lot. I'm guessing for a farm, a thousand hops, not a whole lot. No, it's not. It's uh, from the standpoint of it's cute. Yeah. (laughs) When you go out to the, you know, we go out West uh, to where they grow, you know, hundreds of acres of hops on a single farm. 
um, they think what we're doing out here is very quaint. Um, you know, for that's a flight uh, of them. It, it, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's like a hobby farm. <laughs> you know, because you go out there, and they, you know, one farm will uh, grow 400 acres. The entire New York State crop is just 400 acres. Oh yeah. Well, you know what we say uh, in the east to those on the west: "Where's your water?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they love that, Jeff. The yeah, water. Sure they do. <laughs> As wildfires yeah. rage. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, people people don't like the water jokes. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so we uh, we discovered there was no way we were going to grow this as a commodity that we were going to have to figure out. Either we were going to um, just do it as kind of a pick-your-own thing or we were going to do the brewery. Being that Indian Ladder is already kind of a destination place, uh, we already do cider and we have tons of people coming out here in the fall. It sort of made sense to, to start the brewery, and so we did. So we, we've been now growing hops for 10 years. Um, we're going to be putting more in. Um, we currently have 14 varieties. 14. Yeah. So we sit here at 342 Altamont Road in Altamont, New York at Indian Ladder Farms. Across route, uh, across Altamont Road here on the north side of the road, that's where I see hops. Is that all of the hops? That's the majority of the hops. We do have an experimental yard down uh, across the road that we have some uh, heritage hops um, that... Uh, Hops, uh, one of the, the amazing things about the, the crop is that it's, hops have always grown here in New York State. Um, they're a wild plant that uh, was here. Um, when the Dutch came, they, they saw hops growing here. It's in some of the earliest literature that they record that they're growing here. And the reason they recorded that was not so much that they wanted those particular hops. They knew that their hops would grow here when they came over to make beer. Uh, so you said that you would have hop picking parties. Hops grow quite tall. Uh, yeah, and, and the hop picking parties are, are, it sounds like a really great thing. It's got and the word party in it. It does, and it, it's fun, you know, for the first year, and then the second year it's kind of fun. The third year nobody answers their phone. <laughs> I was going to say, luckily, <laughs> luckily, you still, luckily you still have some friends. You know, you know, it's fun for the first hour. Yeah, <laughs> it's first hour. Uh, hops, you know, they'll grow. Uh, our, we're 18-foot high trellises. They grow to the top. So um, a mature bind, um, in the early days we didn't have mature binds. It takes three years for a hop really to, to reach maturity. And by the time they hit five years, a single plant can weigh 40, 50 pounds. Um, and all the cones that are on there is what we want separated because the lupulin is inside the cones, um, have to be picked by hand if you don't have a picking machine, um, which when we started, the nearest picking machine was in Michigan. Um, and hops require to be picked within an hour of them coming down. So wow. driving them to Michigan was a non-starter. So we I had to pick by hand. I think I saw a Seinfeld episode where they tried to go to Michigan to uh, save save some money. I thought it was cans, though, I believe. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> that was returnables. So. <laughs> so year number one, 100 hops. You had a hop picking party. People came out. That was a good time. Year number two, 1,000 hops. You still got some suckers to come out and help you. How many hops? Hops were you up to year number three when people were no longer all that excited to come out for the hop picking we party? We were about 2,000. We're up to 2,500 now. Um, but yeah, we had, we had put in another 1,000 the, the following year, and we had also um, realized that there was, you know, nobody was coming back to pick that <laughs> um, because it takes one man hour to pick a, a, a hop vine. Wow. And so even though we have different varietals on the farm, which, you know, um, you know, essentially fruit at different times. So all of our hops aren't like, you know, ripe today, you know. So we have like this week we're going to be picking Centennial. Next week we'll probably be picking um, Cascade. Um, so each variety has its own time that it wants to be picked, just like apples. So we pick over, over a three and a half week period. Um, so we ended up, uh, we ended up buying a machine, um, and it, uh, it was made in New York state. It was a small scale machine. It was made by some people who didn't really 
understand hops or the how they were picked and um, wait 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 a second. Yeah. this machine was built by people who had no idea what the purpose of the machine was it's a that's usually yeah. how you build so a machine the, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so the uh, <laughs> kind of like how we're building this podcast right yeah, yeah okay i get it so, so it's a great yeah. machine yeah well it, it's a great machine if your if your end result was supposed to be a boat mooring <laughs> uh, because that's really what it's good for. Um, it's more of a hop destroyer than it is a hop picker. Um, so we ended up picking by hand again uh, and then had to make a rather large investment in um, a used German machine uh, that we had to have brought in uh, through, via Poland um, and uh, set up. And now that uh, lives in its own dedicated barn on the farm. Um, and uh, affectionately called Heidi. Uh, she weighs seven tons, um, was made in 1974. I don't think she wants her weight mentioned on the, <laughs> yeah. on the podcast. We will yeah. mention her. Was, she, yeah. was she named Heidi <laughs> when you bought it? Uh, no. Um, and, and what's funny is that I've talked to, so there, there, there are about, I think, 50 of these machines now in the United States. And whenever you talk to a hop farmer or a brewery that has one of these, you always ask what the name is, and it's always like Gertrude or Helga. Something or, there is, Yes, there is another Heidi. Okay. Uh, so when we got ours, there was a sister machine was brought over, and, and uh, I believe that's Helga, and she lives in Syracuse. <laughs> That's, so a, that's a shout out to Chad at uh, the Vineyard. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> it's a it's a large machine. It's a big noisy machine. It's a noisy. Um, Very unsafe. It didn't didn't come with any instructions. <laughs> the, well, the few instructions there were were in German. Um, <laughs> it was there are machines that are no longer made. Uh, so the co Wolf, the company that makes them, doesn't even really care to talk about them because they've moved on to much bigger machines that cost millions of dollars. Basically, a building. Yeah. Basically a building. Yeah. It is. It's like a, it's like she's like a small building. But um, knowing you like I do, Dieter, you loved this challenge of figuring out how that how Heidi works. Uh, to an extent, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it it got, gets a little frustrating, um, especially when you can't find parts for Heidi. Um, and if like in one year when Heidi broke down in the middle of harvest and we were back to driving hops all over the countryside trying to find other Heidi's. Wow. Um, we now know where most of the Heidi's are within uh, a one hour radius of us. And so, one is probably Dry Town. Uh, yep, Dry Argyle. Town and Argyle, Oneana, um, Northern Eagle Hop Processing has one. Um, there are a few of them in the area. We all kind of know of each other because we all, we all, it, these machines, were made essentially for um, larger hop yards. So, you know, like 40 acres. So it's way more machine than we need or will ever need. Uh, so we pick for other farms. So for example, we picked for Rock and Hops on Saturday. We're gonna be picking uh, for uh, the guys at Sloop on the f fifth. And then we're picking for a, a small, <clears throat> two acre yard up in Johnstown on Sunday or Friday. So we do contract picking. Um, so you really have to know where the other places are because as happened, we broke down right in the middle of picking somebody's stuff and it's off the, you know, so they got a track, you know, they've got a trailer load of hops that are deteriorating and they deteriorate very rapidly uh, once they are down. So we got to get them. It's kind of an emergency situation. We got to get them to another picker. So we start making phone calls. <laughs> Let's start with the, uh, we'll go backwards a little bit. The beginning of the life of a hop. Is it uh, for, for just out of complete ignorance, is it a peren perennial, an annual? It's a perennial. Um, it's, it's a vine as opposed to a vine. Um, so is it perennials, as you know, Jeff, come back every year. Yeah. Uh, as they have the to perennial. be replanted. Um, yes, so you, you kind of think, like I said, you kind of think of hops like you would of grapes or apples. Um, it's a long-term investment. Uh, you're going to, your infrastructure has to be well in place before you do it. It's not, it's not something you're just going to, if you're going to do it to make any money or make beer, it's not really a hobby or something you're going to do in retirement. It's kind of something you 
you're going to be dedicated to. So the people that are really successful at it in the state generally are already farmers. Um, they're probably already growing a high value crop. So people who have vineyards, they, it, there's also a lot of overlap in the equipment, um, which makes it a lot cheaper. Because if you have to go out um, and invest in all the equipment, let alone a hop yard, just to set up a single acre is, is about $15,000. Granted, that is going to provide hops for you if you care for them correctly for 25 years, but it's a sizable investment. Um, and then you need all the things that go along with it in order to care for them. So, 25 years, that's, that's the life of a, of a hop field, um, generally? Hops will, hops will live for very, very long periods of time. They're, you know, they find hops that are you know, growing that are 50, 60 years old. Um, but they're, if you're doing it in a commercial as a commercial standard, you're looking for yield. So as they get older, their yields get to less and less. So, so there's sort of a sweet spot in there. You started in 2009. Uh, your, your hops are basically going through a midlife crisis right now. Uh, our hops are actually in pretty good shape. The uh, prime of their life, then, yeah, one would kind say. Of, they're kind of at the prime of their life, yeah. So uh, I expect these next five years to really be our highest pr production. So you, you've got your hops, uh, they're, they're perennial, they're coming back every year. You, at the beginning of the spring, that's, that's when it's one of the more crucial times to, to care for the hops or no? So the only time we're not in the hop yard is essentially from January to the beginning of March. When there's snow on the ground. When there's snow and there, it's frozen. After that, we are in there. We're cleaning all the dead stuff out from the year before that we didn't get out um, before. Because anything that's in there might harbor disease or bugs or whatever. So we're cleaning all that out. We're repairing irrigation. Um, and then in our case, usually by the end of March, we're usually replanting. Uh, so we're digging rhizomes. So hops grow. On a, on a large root system. Um, the root system is almost as big as what you, underground is what you see above ground. Okay. Um, so th the rhizome is a part of the root that comes off and it has a bud on it. And you can dig those and you can clip those off and you can start another hop. All hops are female that we grow and they're all clones of other hops. So you can do it that way, and that's the most effective, cleanest way to do it. You can also cut you know, shoots off once they come up and root those and start them in a greenhouse. We do that sometimes too. Um, so we're, we're, doing, we're doing that to begin with. That's, this is before they even come up out of the ground um, that we're digging the, the rhizomes. Uh, we're putting mulch back down to uh, put more nutrients into the soil. And then when they do come up, they what you see growing out there is, is two or three binds. So when the hill comes up in the springtime, it can have anywhere from 60 to 200 shoots. And we do not want to allow all those to grow because we're looking to create, you know, flowers, the cones, and we don't want to grow a lot of vegetation. So we have to go through and prune everything back to just two or three. And there's also the, the, when we first started, we didn't understand that it would seem logical that you'd want the most vigorous shoot coming up out of the ground, right? Because that's the one that's gonna produce the most. But that's called the bull shoot. And the it's bull, a lot, of, a lot of fun, a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun. Well, that, well, the hop grows that for a reason, and it, it's you know an evolutionary thing over millions of years. So the hop is essentially growing its own trellis. So the bull shoot is the first thing that comes up, and it's the strongest thing that comes up, so that the other vines can attach to that. Because, like I said, it's a vine, not a vine. So it has trichomes on it, which are these little tiny microscopic anchors. That's what scratches you when you rub a hop vine against you. It'll actually tear your skin open if they're big enough. Um, and they have those little anchors with the twisting of the vine going around, that's what pulls it up and it, it goes up. Whereas a vine has tendrils. If you think like of a grape or a cucumber or something like that, they have those little you know, ringlets that come off and grab onto things and that's how they pull themselves up. 
Um, so we have to get rid of the bull shoot because we are providing um, a medium for it to grow on. We're dropping strings. So that's, you know, after, that's the next thing we do is we go through and we drop strings all through the yard, which takes us a couple of days. Um, and then we go and we train those two or three up that. Is there a preferred uh, material for the string? Uh, yeah, it's actually, it's called Quair. It's a C-O-I-R. And it okay. comes from... Quair? Quair. 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 Everyone Quair. has a different yeah. pronunciation. Quair. Quair. Quair or Quair is usually what you hear. Uh, Spell it again. C-O-I-R. C-O-I-R. Yeah, that's not a word. Tra it, it, training, well, yeah. training is definitely like requires the most amount of manpower. Yeah. And, and harvesting and training the hops is probably like requires the most amount of manpower for caring for the hops. Yeah, and that's um and and the the problem and we, woman ha power. we have with Kathy with Mead. training um, is that each individual variety of hop has a short window of time that it wants to be trained for optimal growth and yield. Um, so we're, we're still figuring that out because a lot of the hops that we have in our yard were developed on the West Coast. And Speaking so their growing conditions are different. So Speaking therefore- Speaking of hops, the best producer on the planet here, Ian, <laughs> yeah, right? is going yeah. to get us he's some our, liquid he's our drink form waiter. of the hops. Thank you. <laughs> Apparently I'm talking too much. because No, that's fine. I got yeah, yeah, look at me. Yeah, 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 well over bear, half a glass of uh, product, product here. here. Yeah, pipe yeah. down, would you? Yeah. <laughs> and I never even asked, I answered the question, what's queer made of? Oh. Oh, yes, that's where we're at. What is Quare made of? Uh, I have no idea. No, okay. uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's made out of um, uh, hairs from the tail of a monkey that are braided You're together. So oh, <laughs> come on. I was totally on board. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. It's a baboon. Well first, <laughs> well, first of all, monkeys don't have tails. Oh, wait, some monkeys do have tails. All right, they're, it's prehensile tails. No, it's made out of coconut husk from Indonesia. <laughs> okay. Wait, so how, Dieter, how long have you had Heidi? Uh, we've had Heidi for, this is our fifth season. Yeah, so five years you've had Heidi, and we're still pulling out, um, we're still pulling out the metal wires that the Germans use from when it was over in Germany that they use as quar. They use metal wire, and Heidi sometimes. Wait, are still you saying the same word, C O I R? Queer. Yeah. Queer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just want to make sure. Yeah. So, but you say quar. I, I don't say know. Quar. Like guar. Quar. Yeah, we I, say. <laughs> I've I've always been brought up as quar. That's yeah. fine. That's um, fine. I just want to make sure I'm not missing so something. I, I, I'm German. In, I call it in, wire. <laughs> I, I call Very it bullshit. Hot, it's not a word. Hop roll. <laughs> it's hop roll. Hop tomato. Roll. tomato. <laughs> Uh, but yes, Heidi still spits out uh, like this metal wire that the Germans use as their quar. They use metal wire, and she still spits out like little chunks of metal wire, yeah. which is pretty interesting. And Heidi does not cool. like anything other than quar or wire. Like you can't use baling twine or plastic twine. It gets nylon wound up. Or rope or anything. Nylon and that is rope. such a fine difference between yeah. the two or three or yeah. four yeah. multiple. <laughs> Heidi is very smart. If Heidi you, is um, like most German-made things. It's a precision instrument to okay. do one thing. Very nice. And don't and don't ask her to do anything. Right. Else, don't you, know? you dare <laughs> bring any dwar or yeah, yeah. dwar yeah, yeah. or soir. Yeah, yeah. Quar only. Heidi is not <laughs> gonna yeah. like that, and she <laughs> will balk or make a really bad noise and stop All working. Right, so yeah, that's that's, that's, that's good, good to know. Hard. That's good to know. So. You could use something else, but Heidi doesn't like anything but quar. No, and we tell people that, you know, new contract pickers that come, you know, we have we have a uh, conversation about what did you grow on? Yeah. Right. Uh, did, oh, yeah. oh, oh, you use quar? Good. That's, that's, that's question right. number one. So Check. When, yeah. you, when you got Heidi, no manual, no instructions, nothing on YouTube, uh, how, how many different types of materials did you go through till you discovered that quar 
was uh, where it no, was. We knew right from the start what the, everybody no, used for. This our, podcast is about instinct. bragging. You know, <laughs> it was <laughs> instinct. I mean, we're just, you know, we have a lot of farming instinct here. And, um, yeah, we, we were right from the beginning, as always. <laughs> <laughs> there are some hobbyists that... When is your like, wife going to be a guest on the podcast? Because uh, I think she we need some... She may come up and uh, she'll start slapping me around. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're, I think we've gone over Quar. Uh, <laughs> I've noticed... Uh, I've spent just a tiny little amount of time in your hop field, uh, learning a little bit and, and training the hops at the beginning of the season. And they go, they grow up the quar. Yes. Clockwise. Yes. Is it uh, the opposite in South America? Yes. Are you serious? Yes. Got something right. Yeah. You nailed it. You nailed yeah. it. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. They, they do, um, you know, everywhere from Argentina down. Um, but... Yeah, so let's see. So now we are at, they're growing up, right? So when we get to... Wicked fast, right? They grow wicked fast. They can grow six inches in a day. You leave the hop yard, you come back, and they've, you know, they're visibly higher. That is incredible. Uh, I've not seen it, but I think someone needs to do a time lapse on a hop field. I haven't seen one either. Well, there's, it's probably out there's probably there's probably there's got to be right. Yeah. I mean, there's time lapse on everything. Exactly. So I'm driving to work. Uh, right now. This is uh, <laughs> this is our pri- this pr- proprietary thing. information uh, <laughs> on Hop Talk episode one. <laughs> hop growing time lapse. We own that idea. No one <laughs> yeah. steal it from us. No don't, one's gonna do it. Don't yeah. take it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they grow so fast because. They're they're trying to they're trying to do things right. So one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to get to a certain height. Right? The sun. They're trying to touch the sun. They want to touch the sun. They don't know that's a bad because they're hops. Right. Right. Um, but you know they if we've done everything correctly, they should hit the wire by the twenty first of June. You put a bell on top of the wire so that like the first one. Ding, Oh, yeah, right. Well, we haven't thought about a bell, but uh, another not, proprietary not idea, idea. Yeah, part of Hop Talk here. Yeah. Make a note I just of that. Like, Who's got the balls to go to the tap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so why why do they hit the top by June twenty first? What's what's the significance that of that is date? The summer solstice. Yes. So, what happens after that? Flowering. Days get short. Well, daylight. Decreases. Daylight decreases. Mm-hmm. So that's a trigger for the hop okay. to stop putting on vegetative growth. And now it needs to start flowering because it wants to reproduce. So it starts putting out, at that point, it stops growing upward. It starts putting out side arms. And on those side arms, it starts putting out burrs. Usually, you know, by mid July, we're in burr stage. They look like little burdocks. Um, and then that's what, you know, the, the cones. Are produced on that. Um, so one one thing you should never do, and we did have a couple of calls of this when we first uh, started doing this, is should I cut all the side arms off? And the answer to that is no. No. <laughs> if anything, <laughs> it, embrace them and get uh, yeah, sailor not tattoos. Cut the side on. arms off because yeah. that's where all your flowers grow. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. like, so like when you drove out here today and you're looking at the hop yard, the hops are loaded with cones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now is a very, very critical time for us because August is supposed to be hot and dry. We're, and we are getting humid, wet, you know, we're getting an inch of rain in 20 minutes. So the cones want to hold water. And mildew is a huge, huge problem for us. And they can. I, I just want to let everyone know this is what we warned you about. This is going to be the funnest part of episode number one. <laughs> We're getting into infestation. Yeah. Yeah. Here comes the infestation. Yeah. Yeah, is- uh, Dieter's getting stressed just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've Get been very beer, stressed please. for the last couple of days because last year we had a disaster where. Um, our proprietary hop, the Heldeberg hops, were just gorgeous. And within two days, they mildewed so hard that when we cut them down and they hit the ground, there were just like puffs of, yeah, that was oh, crazy. of mildew came yeah, off of them. Is there anything you can do for, I mean, that sounds like a really um, quick you process. Mean, you mean other than the gentle sobbing? Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. no, Which doesn't really, help the situation. Really you're adding no, moisture. You're, you're, you're doomed at that point and you just... Massive you, fans. We throw, them in a, we throw them in a pile and burn them. Oh, no. Yeah. This is what he's talking about when he's saying, like, if you want to grow roses or grapes, 
It's like, it can go bad really quickly. Really quickly. I mean, you're one day, you're like, oh my God, yeah. I've got the best crop I have ever had. And then overnight. And then overnight, you're like, holy shit. We so, got to take these down or we lose all of them. You see the weather. You, it's getting, you couldn't pick them a little bit earlier. There's, we there's... frequently pick hops early. We frequently mm. have had to pick hops too early. Um, and this is this is something we get into, in, in especially in, in not just New York states, but you know states that are are new to growing hops. Is they look beautiful, um, and the disease pressure is on, and so people pick their hops too early, and then you know uh, brewers and, and consumers say, well, the hops, you know, they're so grassy. Well, it's because they probably weren't mature. So they didn't have enough lupulin in them to give you the, you know, the fruity notes and, and the citrusy notes that we're, you know, looking for in, in you know, specific varieties. It seems, so precipitation is a double-edged sword with hops. I, I, now, or correct hop. me if I'm wrong, the, the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. great hop growing this area, great for hop because of the moisture, the precipitation. Well, so there's a couple of, couple of things. So hops... Hops need a tremendous amount of water. You're at 18 feet, you're trying to produce, you know, up to 50 pounds of, you know, vegetative material on one plant. It's got to suck up a lot of water. Right. So they need a lot of water, but they don't like to be wet. <laughs> so we have to do, we do drip irrigation on everything in order for them not to be wet. And we, you know, remove all the vegetation below so that even when it does get wet down there, does not grow mildew and go up the plant. Um, so, you know, hobble, like, they'd like to have five gallons of water a week. You know, we don't, we don't get that much in the Pacific Northwest where you know the the big places where they grow hops like in the Yakima Valley Yakima Valley is a high desert yeah it's insane it, it, they don't get any rain I mean they get five to eight inches of rain a year explain this how yeah. how's this work it's, so when, going, we, when we drove through we drove from Seattle to Yakima and beautiful drive by the way and you're driving through as at the, the what Sierras as at the Sierras and just Absolutely beautiful. Giant rain, like forest, and trees are a million feet tall. And then out of nowhere, it's just, you're in the desert. And, yes. then you, and then you go into Yakima and you look around and it's all desert other than right in that valley where it's all, you know, green grass because they have irrigation and they're just okay. pulling stuff in. Okay. Yeah, Water so they're, they're irrigating from the snowmelt okay. in the Yakima River. And there's, you know, you joke about water. They're, they're serious about water out there. I mean, they have things, farms have uh, things like uh, first water rights. And, right. oh, you're buying a farm that has second water rights. You know, so water that's wars. something. Yeah, they have water wars out yeah, there. Like, Here we don't even talk about first and second water rights. We, but we have too much water. <laughs> is, it <laughs> is it a combination of they're on the east side of the Sierras, uh, so the Sierras are holding up the moisture, the snow, the rain is dumping on the mountains, and on the east side, I would imagine, it's typically a lot sunnier than it is on the west side of the range. So is it that combination of them irrigating and so how, how much sun is my question? Is, uh, they is get, the well, they get plenty of, it's generally not cloudy there. Uh, they, do get, they do get a lot of sun there, but it's also that they have this tremendous um, volcanic soil there. Okay. Um, you know, from Talk about how your soil here at Indian Ladder Farms plays into all of the different varieties. We don't, we don't have, do we have volcanic soil, right? Uh, we, Just not there. <laughs> we, uh, we have something called, right <laughs> yeah, we have something called, uh, for those of, for those of you who keep track of your soils, um, we well, have, uh, I mean, anybody we have, who's uh, interested in hop yeah, growing yeah. and farming, so, the okay. soil so, is. All right, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bore you with soil. So we have Shenango <laughs> County uh, gravelly loam. Uh, can have a pillow. We can. Um, <laughs> All right, hold on, hold on. I got Quar. Just got that one figured out. Yeah. Sh uh, what Sh now? Shenango County gravelly loam. Loam. Yeah, it means we have a lot of rocks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, Rocky soil. Oh yeah, we grow rocks like nobody's business. <laughs> Big ones, small ones, a lot of rocks. Um, but I'm that, thinking about becoming a rock farmer. Is anybody is that big? Is yeah. that in? Is that yeah. we're, we're already on it, man. <laughs> but this particular soil um, is is really good for growing hops and apples because it drains really well, right? Sure. Okay. So the other thing the hops don't like is wet feet. 
wet feet. Yeah, they're roots. They don't want to be in standing water. Gotcha. So they want the they water get all wrinkly and whatnot. They, well, they want so they love a lot of water. They don't like to be wet. They don't like to have their feet wet. But they got to be getting a, a tremendous amount of water. Um, so diva. They, yeah, they are mm-hmm. very. They're very much a diva plant. <laughs> um, yeah, and Indian ladder is unusual in in this area. We're surrounded by swamp, um, and the farm actually, the cultivatable part of the farm, actually sits as kind of a little hump of an island in the middle of the swamps. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it was a glacial deposit of of this particular soil. Um, so we're very lucky in that we can grow hops here because we, we get people all the time, you know, asking, can we grow hops here or there? You know, can I grow? I had one guy, he wanted to grow, he had 40 acres of, you know, bottom land. It was right along the river. Sounds great, except for it's right along the river. So he had, fo- you know, he had standing fog most mornings in the summer. So he's got too much moisture in his air. The hops do not like that, obviously. Um, and he was going to have wet feet, so not a good place to grow hops. So everybody, and tell me if maybe this has gone down because everyone's realized what a pain it is. There was a, a real big movement, uh, home brewing, and everybody wanting to grow hops in their backyard. It would seem like you need a really big backyard and either an incredible amount of luck to grow uh, the amount of hops that you need and the quality of hops that you need to brew your own beer. And plus, uh, Scott, you're doing an incredible job putting out so many delicious beers all the time. It's just so much easier to let the professionals do it now. Is that, have you, is home brewing down because of, you're, you're giving me a headache with what a what a headache it is to to grow hops to get lucky, well, so, it seems right. like, with your skills. So growing hops is like from a home brewer standpoint, um, and home brewing, by the way, is is up during COVID. I mean, okay. it, it, it's okay. going through the roof. Because I forgot we got <laughs> yeah, a right. pandemic. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. but but hops, you know. So it, it, I'm I'm making it sound really hard to grow hops, and I get accused of that. And, and people say, "Well, you're discouraging people from growing hops." I'm I'm not discouraging people from growing hops. I'm discouraging telling people the reality of growing hops on the scale that we grow them, um, which is a commercial scale. If you want to grow them a few hops in your backyard, you'll probably have tremendous success. And if you're just a home brewer with your five or 10 gallon pails, you're going to have more hops than you know what to do with. It's going to make a great wet hop beer. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because that is a big difference between what you have going on here. It's like you grow tomatoes. Hey, everybody grows great tomatoes on their balcony. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Now now go plant five acres. Uh huh. Okay. (laughs) Feel the pain. Feel the pain. Yeah. Is there a indoor way, a hydroponic way to grow hops? Is there, can you control the environment, the climate? Uh, or Absolutely. Just, the problem is yields. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right it's on. just, Cost. you know, you need such a big facility to, to grow on the scale that, you know, would be viable. Okay. It's a lot of lights. Yeah. A lot of lights. I mean, it can be done. People and and do. I just, because of the loss and the, the risk of loss and how, to me, it seems like it, that risk is big. Uh, maybe it would be worth it to to cover a, a multi-acre field and climate control it and, or or whatever. It, it's it's really hard in that hops grow so well in in the Willamette Valley and in the Yakima Valley, and there's just no way on a commercial scale like that that you will be able to be competitive. Um, you, you would have to charge so much money per pound for your hops um, that there's very few brewers that are going to go, well, hey, it's, it's uh, hydroponic. I'll pay $20 more a pound. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's they unlikely. They do that organic. They, they, well, <laughs> you know, and, and that's you're charging a premium for your product. I just I don't see that there is a premium that you could charge for a beer because it's hydroponic. Oh, sorry, sorry. There was a standing there. There was a difference between organic and neglect. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, yeah. can you explain to me what organic is? Organic is a word that was made up by Mr. Rodale in the 60s. It's just it's a made up word like Kodak. 
Okay. Uh, to describe something it never existed prior till I think 1965 or okay. something like that. So organic is a is a, is a practice of trying to use lower. Um, uh, lower, smaller amounts of chemicals into the environment, uh, fewer insecticides, fewer fungicides. Um, and uh, so here on Indian Ladder Farms, we are not organic. We are, we are IPM, uh, we're integrated pest management. Um, so we, uh, we are actively working to use the smallest amount of chemicals that we have to use um, because there's a misunderstanding and sometimes we find it with hop farmers that, as Scott was just saying, that organic does not mean neglect. Um, there are organic chemicals that you can spray on your hops. I mean, copper is considered an organic. Copper is a highly toxic chemical um, that if it's overused can be you know a, a health issue um, so it's not if you're going organic part of the problem in New York State is we don't have a lot of tools in the toolbox because the chemical companies have not been willing to invest the money to license the products that an organic farmer would need in order to be successful because it's just so expensive and there aren't enough hop farms there, there are materials. They, they grow organic hops successfully out west. Uh, maybe pest is the wrong word for it, but are there any insects that are good for hops that you'd like to see around? Oh, my God. We love spiders and ladybugs. Okay. Ladybugs are yeah. Because yeah. they yeah. eat all the aphids. Yeah. All, all the aphids. And we like mite destroyers. Yeah. There's, uh, there's They're like superheroes. Yeah. It's very tiny. Yeah, so awesome. so well, let's talk about a little infestation with your ins your insect I friends. I promise Jeff. this will right. be the most yeah. exciting part of this yeah. uh, episode yeah. number so, one here. So a lot of places have different uh, problems. Uh, we the the things that we're fighting mostly are um, p potato leaf hoppers um, and two spotted spider mites. These are fantastic band names, first <laughs> off. We are the Potato Day Poppers. Yeah. We're opening up for the spider mites. <laughs> <laughs> and the pants are up next. Yeah. <laughs> the pants are off? No, That's what I heard, too. They're oh. coming on next. The oh, pants I, are up next. I already have my oh. pants off. <laughs> um... Yes. Yeah, so yeah, where were we now before uh, we band were at names? The, well, let's start well, with band the, names the, the leaf hoppers. <laughs> All right, the okay, leaf hoppers. So we, in probably second week of June, we start going out and we start looking, turning leaves over, and we're looking for leaf hoppers. And leaf hoppers, um, they're here. Uh, they live here, but they also, big infestations, they blow in from storms from the south. So okay. think of like a nor'easter in the summertime, we get one of those big storms, thunderstorms that comes up the coast. That blows in all kinds of insects. A lot and, of people probably listening to this podcast while they're driving right now, I don't want them to be Google imaging leafhopper. What does it? What does a leaf hopper look like? How big is it? It's uh, they're very small, um, like but, the the head of a pen. Uh, probably twice that size. Okay. When they're mature. Okay. So what we're trying to find is the adult. See how many adults there are on the bottom of a leaf, and how many you know. The problem is, is not the adults. It's the uh, you know the little grubs they. Well, isn't that leaves. life in general? Yeah. So if you're really bad, you start seeing the tips of your <laughs> leaves. Your hops are burned. We call that hopper burn. If you have hopper burn, you pretty much are you're going to have to spray. And that's not exclusive to hops, right? Is that a uh, lot alfalfa, of different? So, so alfalfa um, leaf hoppers love alfalfa. So we we recommend that if you are in an area, um, you know, where your neighbor has large hay fields and they um, are going to mow those fields. Do not put your hop yard right next to that because that yard, um, that hay field is going to be filled with leaf hoppers because they, they love it. It's probably not affecting his alfalfa that much because it's such a huge environment, right? But once he mows it, where are they all going? To your hop yard. Your place. That is really something to consider. Next door. <laughs> is, is this a, a big problem? Do you, and I'm not looking for you to call out any neighbors that you might have, unless you want to call them out. Hey, Blue! But you Blue. really <laughs> need, you, Blue's out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
Do you I, really have to work in conjunction with with your neighbors, or just be a jerk and don't? Yeah, I'm a, right now there's nobody growing alfalfa around us, so you know that's not a huge issue for us. So, but the um, same would probably be true as far as uh, people that might be using pesticides that you don't want to things that might be seeping into your your water. Uh, your, your, we your try to keep the aquifer. pesticide use yeah. too. There's many reasons to keep pesticide use to to a minimal. I mean, there's IPM. A, uh, well, there you go. Look so, so think of it. <laughs> if you think of it from an economic standpoint, every time that sprayer has to roll through the apple orchard or the hop yard, it's a gigantic expense. So you don't want and to just do fuel that. alone. You mean or manpower? The the fuel, chemicals, the, manpower. Yeah, everything. Um, and so we don't we we don't want to spray. So that's why we're doing IPM. So we're we're constantly trying to figure out can the plant survive this? Right? Um, is it strong enough? Is it healthy enough? Are there enough insects on the that are there that will keep this in check? Right? So we want to have a healthy environment. The problem with most pesticides is that they they're not targeted. So it's just a wholesale killer. So you, when you have to roll out there, not only are you destroying the hoppers, oh great, hoppers are gone. So are all your spiders, so are all your ladybugs, mm. and so are all your mite destroyers. So now we, the next infestations that we get are from two spotted spider mites, and they reproduce way faster than any predators. So now we've set ourselves up for a big problem um, that we got two spotted spider mites and nothing to control them naturally. So if we don't have to spray, man, we don't. Do you ever feel as though farmers should have a, a salary that's equal to doctors? The science is is pretty equal to each other. It's yeah, the amount of knowledge that you have that you, that you, and the experimenting and the, okay, tried this, this didn't work, lost the whole crop. Yeah, and then you have to you, you you try to you know catalog that and and figure out what's going to destroy you next year. Do you have a fun little notebook with with all I of have your jottings? All and... sorts of fun little notebooks. <laughs> 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 I got a lot of doodles. Like have we have, have we covered everything you want to cover regarding <laughs> infestation? Uh, oh well, let's talk about uh, Japanese beetles. Yeah. Okay. Right? Okay, so Japanese beetles are an insect that was introduced, like, you know, a lot of things. Um, came from Southeast Asia, and... Um, are we all correct when Eastern, we call... Not we, Eastern Asia? <laughs> the, when we all refer to, it's the common beetle that's, that's around this area. That's yeah, the you, Japanese see, like, beetle. you see it, like, on if you grow grapes, you'll see lacing. Um, if you grow roses, um, you okay. see the lacing. They're the shiny, bluish, yeah. green beetles. They have very beautiful color. They're an attractive insect. Yeah. I'll give them that. Um, but so a pain we, in our butts. Yeah. So when we first started growing hops, and Japanese beetles, like a lot of things, have cycles. You know, so they'll be really bad one year and not so bad the next year. And um, so when we, the first or second year we grew hops, we had this massive infestation of Japanese beetles, and they some varieties. They just loved, and we went out and they had just laced the leaves, right? So they had eaten all the in-between soft tissue and left just the veins. Looked like a doily. Yeah. <laughs> <What? laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our immediate reaction was, well, we got to kill these things, right? You know, they're, they're killing our crop. Um, let's look up the in the IPM book, which the only IPM book we had for hops was from Pacific Northwest. They don't have them. So there isn't even a page. Aren't they closer to Japan gonna... than we are? They, they didn't get them. Okay. They flew right over. Yet. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> they don't want them. But the hop is... So we immediately were trying to find something. How do we spray these? Um, we had them in our raspberries here and so on. So they'd spray the raspberries. They'd all fly across the road to the hops. We'd spray the hops. They'd all fly back. We discovered that the hops are so vigorous at the time of year that the Japanese beetles come out, then in most seasons, the best thing to do is nothing. Okay. Just let them eat them. And the, hop, the Japanese beetle will go through its cycle. The hop leaves will regrow. 
they'll grow. We had a fine crop that year even. And, and you've even done so. nothing to affect nature. Right. Because again, I don't want to spray Japanese beetles because then I've killed all my beneficial insects mm -hmm. for no reason at all. Exactly. You know? Is there another insect that can take out a Japanese beetle? Oh, I see where you're going with this, Scott. I like uh, it. Unfortunately, not that I'm aware of. So there will be no wagering. All right. Well, well. there's always wagering. <laughs> and should I put my pants back on? Get some praying mantises <laughs> out there. <laughs> so the Japanese beetle. Yes. Well, you want some? No, oh, I don't. Right. No, I, I don't. Yeah, and it's uh, people are like, well, they put milky spore out on their yards and like that. And they're like, well, why don't you put that, you know, like on the farm? Like, how? Uh -huh. <laughs> who, who are these people that you refer to? There are 340 to? acres here. These, We're not your front yard. Are these peers? <laughs> are these other farmers? These people you refer no, to? Just no. jamokes like me that come in. No, it's oh, them. Hey, Scott, why don't you bring this? Be oh, that's the Japanese beetle talking? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh, oh. They said. Okay. They said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Quar. They said quar. Uh -huh. They should make a way to get rid of Japanese beetles. I wish they would make a way. Who are Scott, they? I want to talk to you. Scott is the brewer here at Indian Ladder Farms. I have a blue windsock. You do. I have a black, Alex red, and Dieter black. Thank you for uh, that tidbit, Scott. Appreciate you have that. a gray shirt on, Scott. <laughs> Actually, and my last name is Gar Al Garing. Dieter it's not, it's Garing. Dieter Black. <laughs> Yeah, right. what, what, what you want to talk about there, sir? Well, I want to talk about you clearly uh, depend on the hop. You can't make beer without your hops. That's true. Mm -hmm. It's I, hop uh, dependency. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's a big part of, yes, speaking of hops, I will have some more hops in a glass. I think we can all take so, some more hops. Get yourself you know, a hop. I, I, lo I love to uh, any... Get yourself something nice. One of my favorite <laughs> hops I like to use here on the farm that we grow is, uh, it's one that's called Brewer's Gold. Um really sure where it originated from. Probably a beer from drinker. From, <laughs> from England, I can, right? I can help you with that. Yeah. You know, okay. You got, you got that, Dad? Uh, Scott, what, <laughs> we'll, we'll go into our varieties yeah. of hops and why we why I chose certain ones because that is a long story and it interrupts Scott just like this. <laughs> okay. That's for Hop Talk. <laughs> That's for Hop <laughs> Talk episode two. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, we are calling it Hop Talk? Well, this yeah, is sure, official now? Sure, yeah. I think we are. I, th I want to go well, with Quar. Quar Talk. Quar Talk. Quar Talk. So easy to Quar Boys. Quar Boys. Quar Boys. A couple of choir boys. <laughs> yeah. But uh, back to it. Yeah. yeah. All right. You got your golden boy, or what's yeah, it called? I got my golden boy. Uh -huh. No, the uh, the Brewer's Gold, which yeah. I'm a huge fan of. Um, it has these beautiful notes of tangerine. Um, it's high in uh, in geranol, which is uh, like a it's an essential oil. What, real quick, it's got notes of tangerine. Is yes. it in any way, shape, or form related to a tangerine? Why does it have it? It's uh, just it's, it's similar. just because of the, the the essential oils that are in there. So gotcha. you would probably get that a lot from uh, like limonol and linenol as well. It's like it's like cannabis having different oils that yeah. uh, smells or terp. Okay, okay. You know? People yeah, can finally, reference that. Yeah. Finally, you can get Jeff can wrap his head around yeah. it. Now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, 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 so oh, terp, oh, oh, terp, oh, different oh, strains oh, of cannabis oh, smell oh, differently oh, because oh, of their oil content and their their terpenes that are present. They're, and hops and cannabis are very sim similar. If you were going to break it down chemically, uh, a tangerine and its oils, yeah. would that be the same chemical makeup as your golden boy and the tangerine essential oils that are in <laughs> you it? You mean our brewer's, brewer's gold. gold. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, like, I, like, I like golden boy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's your golden boy. Right? I, I do like that hop a lot. Although and, that's probably and, and someone grows, else's grows, beer name, huh? And it grows. We have a cider name called. You do, okay? That's <laughs> and, it, and it grows so well here. Too. All right. Um, if you go out to the yard. It's just it, it is one of the best smelling hops, and it grows so well. Real pungent. Yeah, it is awesome. I love that hop so much, and it's it's really cool because I don't know many people that use Brewer's Gold. It's Why? Like, I don't know. Well. It, it, part Why of it, is the sky blue? I feel like well, Brewer's I mean, Gold is almost <laughs> looked at as like a noble Dieter, would you hop. like to explain yeah, what Brewer, a sky is? Well, Brewer's Gold, I think... It's like an old and, school and hop. Brewer's Gold for us is really what shows for us terroir, Jeff. 
Ah, <laughs> I know you like that yeah, word. I haven't, heard that. I haven't heard that Lots about seven months today. <laughs> so Brewer's Gold is a, is a relatively inexpensive hop that we can buy from you know one of the big brokers and like that, but it's not the same. I mean, no, it's totally different. So if he has to substitute like West Coast Brewer's Gold for one of his recipes, the beer is going to taste yeah. completely different. Um, it's just the Brewer's Gold we grow here, even though the rootstock came from the West. Whether it's the you know our soil or you know temperature variations, the terroir. The terroir. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's our, the kind of soil we have? Susquehanna uh, uh, feet. I, Jeff, no, look, that's Pennsylvania. Jeff, look at, Jeff, look at your, look at your notes. Look I have so many, <laughs> and the core has just overtook my whole page. It's the uh, what was it, Dieter? What's the soil? Uh, it's the this is the core episode. I think. <laughs> Shenango, Shenango, gravelly loam. Yeah, gravel. Uh, the gravel. Yes. I like gravel. Kind of gravel. All right, back to your back to your golden boy. But yeah, no, it, it is a, it is a great hop to use. But when it comes down to sour beers. Um, because I make a lot of those around here. Um, I'm not really looking for any of those. I'm kind of just using the hops as pretty much as like a preservative, as they would do in Belgium when making Lambic beers. And uh, so we grow a lot of crystal as well. So crystal is very low in alpha acids, and alpha is what gives you a lot of like your bitterness. So they're very low with those. Um, so you don't get any bitterness, so I can use about two and a half kilos for, uh, you know, like a 350, 52 liter uh, batch. Um, so you, like you get a little bit of that hop note, but it's also acting as a preservative. So when it goes through the souring process and barrel fermentation, that it's gonna help ward off a lot of bad bacteria, such as like E. coli, um, I mean, bacteria that I'm looking for with those beers like Britannomyces and Pediococcus and uh, a little bit of lactic, uh, lactic acid bacteria. How many, how many key ingredients are there in your average beer? You got the hops. You got hops, you have malt, you have water. Is it 25% importance? Per ingredient that you just mentioned there, oh, totally. Or totally. Uh, uh, so not so. I, I would say water is definitely your most important. Just like a good bagel, of course. You got to have good water. Yes. Yeah, New York pizza because right. of the water. Right. Chlorinated water. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, right. you, well, if, if you had to, and I know this is probably like who's your which which kid is your favorite, but water is is the key ingredient. Yeah. Water, water is definitely for all over for for the beers. Followed by. Uh, hops. Hops. Then yeast. Then yeast. Yeah. Um, so it really is important for what kind of style beer you're going to make as to what kind of hop you're going to use. Yes, totally. Totally. Um, every, every year that we, uh, we send our hops out for, for analysis, we get all of that back, and I basically just print off that little sheet that has all the hop oils on there, and I look at them, it's like, okay, well... I want to make an IPA, so I want to go something that's a little bit floral with a little bit of dankness. So I want a little bit of a higher, like, immersing content. So, like, I'll look at which ones we got there. Okay. And so we'll you kind of put the cart before the horse. You're like, I want to make this beer. I got to go get the horse. Yeah, I'm not just pissing in the wind here. Uh -huh. Check those oils. <laughs> And, and the hops, it, they change every year, too. Mm -hmm. So he has to pay attention to, if he's trying to duplicate something and get it as close to what it would tasted like last year, yeah, he may have something to, that's very similar. He has to look for something that's similar, or he has to increase or decrease um, how much he uses. You know, and, and also, for the most part, I mean, we do some single hop beers, but mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, what's part of, you know, the brewer's art, so to speak, is how are these various chemicals going to interact with each other from the different hops? Because you're blending different hops that have different ratios um, and different characteristics. How do you make those taste good? Yeah. It's like being a chef. Right, Chef Morad? Oh, good one, Scott. <laughs> Very God. nice. There's uh, every year there's Stuart an annual so hop growers convention or a hop convention mm -hmm. that you go to. I, I got to imagine that's, that's important. Oh, it's very important. It's how you find, it, you it learn is, the trends. How are your hops doing? What's going on here? It's great with networking. And, uh, of course, there's still a lot of hop research out there. 
any type of you know wrinkle in our brain we can get with learn something new with hops. Yeah, we always come yeah. back with something that was like totally mind blowing. Well, you know? yeah, artificial intelligence hops. is probably. I mean, the way these computers are able to break down whatever the hell they're doing, whatever they're breaking down, uh, it's got to be very exciting, I'm sure. Is, is there a hop that is being developed now that you can't wait to work with that isn't quite there well, they, yet? They, they, they usually have a lot of numbers. Like, they have a lot of experimental numbers, um, which is eventually, like, because uh, some of these big, uh, big growers will have experimental hops, and then they just have a number. And maybe it goes on... And if it does really well, like they'll... Mambo number five, like Mambo number uh -huh. five, or yeah. like uh, what was the big one that came out from uh, Yakima, which was uh, HBC three six nine, and that ended up being Mosaic, and unfortunately HBC four twenty did not make it in there, but that <laughs> but that was one that had a lot of notes of coconut. I think Sierra Nevada used that in one of their beers, and uh, then. Does the hop end up, I, I, I can't think of any, but I don't live in the hop world. Do the people who created them get the hop named after them eventually after the, you know, label, code, numbers? That I do not know. That's, uh, yeah. that's a good question for Dr. Paul. There's a, okay. the, but you've the, met Dr. Paul. I have He's met a very interesting dude. That guy has <laughs> a brain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the whole, you know, the whole development of individual hops and where they come from and how they, you know, why some are proprietary and stuff is a whole other subject. Yeah. So, so we can't talk about your proprietary hop, the Heldeberg hop? It's a whole other subject? Is that episode two, three? for um because i did want to talk about it i do i do like to leave him wanting more okay that's fair <laughs> that's fair um, yeah i think that you know we'll get into you know because people are always like well why can't you grow citra here or why can't you grow any of these sexy the sexy hops mm -hmm. and it's because we don't own the rights to citra citra is grown by farmers that paid a tremendous amount of money to develop it yeah. Well, tell me why that is. Is certain apples you you, you don't have to have we rights? Have propri we There's have proprietary, proprietary apples. apples on okay, the farm. this is episode two. Ooh, yeah, I what? You ever heard of a Snapdragon? You ever hear of a Snapdragon? Hell yeah, oh. I have. That's yeah, proprietary. Yeah. I thought that was going to be the sound that Jeff makes when he cracks your neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a lot to learn. Yeah, so, right. so we can get into in another episode, you know, uh, we were talking, you know, briefly about where Brewer's Gold comes from, I know, um, and it's also... It came it, from Dieter's, uh, Dieter's Yard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it was developed in, in, in England by a, a, a professor at a university who also was in an apple breeding program, and we actually have some of his apples here, and... Um, and so that's a whole other whole other subject. Well, we shall get into that then. Uh, again, the working title is Hop Talk. Dieter, Alex, Scott, Ian, I am Jeff. We look forward to being downloaded wherever you download podcasts and listen to them. And uh, bye. this has been this has been a good first run. I think so. Yeah. yeah Hopefully, we have at least one. You've been listening to Indian Ladder Farms Cidery and Brewery owner-operator Dieter Gary, its head brewer Scott Veltman, and its head cider maker Alex Gill. The producers and engineers are Troy Pohl and Ian Carlton. Any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions can be directed to podcastilf at gmail.com. That's podcastilf at gmail.com. I'm Jeff Morad. Thanks for listening. See ya!